Honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to have a look with you to the future ways we will be using interactive systems. Now, the subtitle Smart People and Smart Environments refers to the fact that I want to come up with a balanced story between technology on the one hand, but also the needs of people using computers on the other hand. And we share with our colleague the challenge of looking ahead as many as 40 years. And in a field that is technology driven as ours, it's really a chance. And we can clearly illustrate that by looking back 40 years. Think about the computers we had at the time. We had mainframe. We were really in the childhood of interactive systems. And most of these systems were equipped with uh, uh, facilities to provide data input and only used by professionals in academia and business environments. You can make the exercise yourself. When did your first computer appear in your living room and how did it look like? Maybe this looks a bit familiar for some of you. The Commodore 64 is certainly one of the more cheaper types that really made it to the living room. And shortly afterwards there was, were systems such as Apple Macintosh that after being affordable and for those who could afford it also entered not only business environments but also uh, the home of several people. Now what's really different between those two systems is what you see on the screen and the way you interact. And the reason why I mention this is uh, to look ahead towards the kind of challenges nowadays research is facing. So on the right you see that we can interact with several kinds of data almost on the screen, on the data itself, which was not the case in the earlier systems. And we will speed up uh, towards the future in a minute, but to show you that what research is interested in is clearly influenced by the kind of application that's needed at a certain moment, I'd show you this one. You can have several examples, but for instance, because data input was very important at the time, efficiency of data input was very important, and research focused, for instance, on all kinds of weird keyboards that could provide more efficiency. Now, it's clear that not all of these devices really make it at the end, so efficiency, efficiency is certainly not the only factor driving the user experience and driving the fact that an innovation is accepted or not. As a last uh, blick back uh, in the history, I show you this one. And the reason why I show you this picture of pen computers and e-readers is because, well, if you look at the dates, those kind of devices are around quite a while. Like early in the 90s and early 2000s, we already had those special devices meant to read books and articles. And if you consider the kind of innovation that we've seen since then, well, of course, displays became brighter, had a better resolution, uh, you can interact more easily, devices became lighter and so on. But we haven't seen in this particular example a real paradigm shift. So that's one of the points, uh, one of the things I want to emphasize when we look ahead uh, to the future, like what can we expect. And we start looking at the future by mentioning a very important name in the area of smart environments, which is closely linked to ubiquitous computing, and that is Mark Weiser. In his article in Scientific American in 1991 already, he described what he meant by smart environment or ubiquitous system. And I will briefly summarize this by saying he considered special hardware and software that was connected to, let's say, contemporary network systems, whatever that might be at a certain point in time. And the system would become so ubiquitous that no one will notice their presence. And this uh, has been connotated afterwards by other authors with uh, saying, well, what we want, in fact, is just invisible computers, not easy computers, but invisible computers. And in fact, in this kind of system, you expect the system, the environment, to be really smart and to have all kinds of intelligence algor algorithms at hand that would solve your problem. So you would be, in fact, in a, in a way of sit back, uh, sit back and relax and the system will do whatever you want it to do. This way of computing has been called afterwards by other authors who questioned the fact calm computing, because the user was not really doing a lot in this uh, kind of systems. 
Now, one of the initial scenarios that Mark Weiser used in his paper was this one. Think about any, uh, let's say, work environments where a lot of displays are around and people, people are working on displays. It's still what we investigate nowadays. And probably we will still investigate several of these uh, applications in a while. Uh, probably if you look really in detail towards the figure, this is just a mock-up and not all of these systems will have been functioning at the, at the time. So we made progress, but we will need a while before everything is wireless, everything is easy to work with and will really connect not only devices but also persons. So what do we want in this uh, smart environment? I already <coughs> emphasized the fact that the original vision, let's call it the paradigm of smart environment, really focused on the system that would solve the problem. But what about us human beings? Is that really what we want? No, certainly not. And that's, that has been investigated in several trials. You can think of several application domains, uh, let's say smart homes, um, I already mentioned the intelligent meeting rooms and so on. As a user, you really want to be in control. But of course, you want to be supported by the system too. So finding the right balance between the intelligence, intelligence system on the one hand and what you can do as a user and how you can do it in a pleasant and efficient way is a very important topic that will be there for a while. So for the remainder of the presentation, I want to give uh, you some examples of, let's say, smart environments or driving technology <coughs> behind it. Uh, with systems on different scales that might give an example of what we envision for the future. Because the overall idea that was expressed by Mark Weiser, the smart environment, if you, um, let's say, if you correct it a bit and give the human user a larger role, that is so general that it will still be around and driving the research uh, for the next uh, few decades, I guess. So, first example is the Illumini room. And the idea is that you want not only people to do, let's say, professional applications, but you want to make it more engaging. And we have seen how entertainment took over lots of uh, applications and became uh, a very important research topic, too. Um, for several years, you have those kind of uh, applications where lighting conditions are envisaged, envisaged to see uh, how they influence uh, what we mean as a user about the environment. And this Illumini room goes a step uh, further. What it basically does is enhance your, let's say, your home theater with all kinds of facilities to project on the walls and to give you the impression that you're really there. And one example on the slide is, for instance, uh, here, where you have, uh, for instance, a racing game and where the racing track seems to come into your room. Um, now, within these smart environments where the devices are able to offer you lots of services, it's not always easy to know why something is happening. And bringing, again, the focus more in terms of the human user that is there, we can think about all ways how we can provide the user with enough information about the environment. And in fact, the user wants to question what happens in the environment. This is called intelligibility uh, in the field. And what you see here is an, uh, let's say, a research experiment that was done in uh, our lab where we want to explain the effect of things after it happens. So the user can ask all kinds of why, why not questions, when did things happen, and how is the causality between different events. A step further in this kind of uh, research regarding intelligibility is this small example, which we call the feed-forward torch. Because um, nowadays, projectors get that small that you can have it either built in or mounted on top of your smartphone. Sorry about that. So here you see uh, one research setup where a small projector is mounted uh, on top of a smartphone which you can use similar as a torch. And for instance, here uh, in our Ola, in the research center, we have all kinds of buttons on the wall, and it's not very clear what they are meant for all the time. So with this kind of system, you can have additional information before you really do the action. Now, uh, 
what we already saw in the previous presentation also is that social connection becomes very important and involving large groups of persons and having communities uh, is certainly one of the things that uh, will go on over the next uh, years. And one of the examples uh, we recently found is this one. Probably you are familiar with uh, the idea of mechanical Turk. If you, has, if you have some task that needs lots of effort and you need lots of people or you need a human judgment around a certain topic, you can subdivide the task and uh, give it to lots of people and collect uh, the result afterwards. Now that kind of action uh, nowadays also gets coupled to interactive systems. And this is just one example where you, uh, you have a certain text you start from in a word processor and then certain fragments are, let's say, fed into the community and using crowdsourcing, all people can suggest improvements for the text which are afterwards suggested by the user and the user can select whatever suits uh, in a specific purpose. So once again, the control of that one particular user stays very important. Another example of our own research where we try to involve the social network in uh, uh, an application in, in the care domain here is a ubiquitous help system for people with dementia. So the idea is that at a certain moment in time, you want to reach a person that it's suitable to provide the help that is required. And you can have um, an overview, let's say, of the social network of the person. Uh, you know which person is available or is not available, and you can address the question for help to the right person. So we expect that we will see lots uh, more of this kind of uh, applications of social networking in all kinds of application domains. So one thing you might have noticed in the previous examples is that also in the future this place seems to be everywhere. And I think it's difficult uh, to say that this is not the case, but this place you can consider it in a very broad way. Of course there will be large displays, but for instance nowadays the interest is less in registering the images and projecting the images uh, with large resolution and so on. The interest is more in how can we interact with the display. Will we, will we be using all kinds of gestures like when you're playing with a Kinect at home, but do you really want to do that kind of very strange gestures when you're together with other people in a public place? So you see there still is some research uh, to be done there. On the other opposite of the spectrum, we have the very small displays, of course, and we recently saw an example which is called the nail display, where you have a small OLED display uh, on your finger. Uh, the device also, co of course, contains a microprocessor, also vibrator and tracking equipment. And the example you see here is that the device can be used as a transparent device to facilitate a precise selection. So what's under it, in this case, for instance, the keyboard uh, of a small device can be enlarged so that you can more easily make uh, your selection. They also give another example in their paper, which is a person wearing this kind of device while being in a meeting and at a certain point in time, you see that an avatar is uh, appearing on the screen with terminology boss be needed. So the boss is calling and very discreetly the person can decide to accept or to refuse the call just by moving his finger slightly aside, uh, which is tracked and uh, results in an action. So it's not the most easy display, but maybe in future there might be interesting applications. <laughs> Um, for several years, research is also considering all kinds of bendable and foldable uh, devices uh, also to be used as displays. And bend bendable uh, and rollable interfaces might be very interesting, but they still have the disadvantage nowadays that once you bend them a bit too much, they will just crack. And uh, uh, there you go with your nice application. So that's a reinforced interest in all kinds of um, foldable interfaces and this is a research experiment we did because there's not only the technical challenge of making the, the nice displays with this material but there's also the challenge to investigate do we really want to use it and how can we use it 
So this uh, experiment, for instance, investigated the kind of actions we take when we do 3D puzzling, which is uh, clearly a bimanual task, and what kind of interaction can be done to look up information um, and to grow towards information uh, using this prototype. Displays everywhere, but displays are not always those uh, very um, clear uh, hardware issues. Here another example, uh, it's a community project that was recently done in UK and the idea was to do something in a certain street uh, in the city with respect to uh, electric savings. And the inhabitants would uh, daily or weekly put in some data using their smartphone or a web interface and weekly a graffiti artist would paint a graph on the floor, on the, on the street. In fact. Of course, this is not what you want to have in every street of the city, but anyway, it uh, shows that uh, community is important um, to have mutual awareness of the situation, but also that this place uh, can be a very uh, large, uh, can have a very large scope. Uh, so to summarize just a few other trends, uh, but I will quickly over it. Big data is a, um, a term that you hear everywhere. Of course, it also uh, provides us in the field of human-computer interaction with additional uh, challenges. If you have lots of data, you need to find the correct data and you want all kinds of interfaces to browse through the data and to find your right data uh, in addition to intelligent algorithms. And Another uh, trend, of course, is gamification, which uh, passed the state of being only entertainment and can be applied in very serious way, for instance, uh, in care and rehab situation, where also the social dimension uh, is exploited more and more. So we've seen lots of uh, interesting examples, I think, of future interactive systems and users will be there, will want to take control over the system, but this brings us to the question, who will do the programming? And of course, there is a trend, uh, not always pleasant for engineers and computer scientists, but end-user programming is hot and will be there more and more. And this is just one example, specifically in the area of smart environments, where the environment as such can be modeled, for instance, uh, using models and ontologies, but to program the action of the, environment, of the environment, you can use just simple photo-based interfaces. And it's not restricted to software and programming software action only. Also hardware and programming hardware is getting more and more uh, accessible for lots of people. So this is just one example. And considering the rise of uh, facilities as fabrication labs everywhere, this is certainly also a trend uh, we are looking forward uh, to follow in the future. So I want to conclude by thank you, thank also, I'm not that clever, so I had some help from uh, the colleagues, and thanks for listening. <laughs>